Hi everyone. All right, so as you just heard, today we're here to answer a crucial question. And uh, this question does not pertain just to Africa, but it resonates to the rest of the world. And that is action or reaction to save the planet. So, so today I'm going to focus a little bit more on the energy sector and what our experience is with regards to this and how we can look at different aspects and discuss different aspects to, to look at, um, to solve some of the areas and to also understand the complexities that goes with the cleaner production within the energy sector. Right. Oh, okay, there we go. Right. So, as most of you know, um, so in Africa um, and in South Africa specifically, but in Africa up until now, mostly of most of the generation and the supply chain of electricity happened in a vertically integrated system where we had mostly um, coal fire gener coal fire generation power system plants, and a lot of the in African areas we had a lot of hydros. But if we look at specifically Africa, South Africa, um, which has lot, which has the largest um, capacity um, of demand as well, there's a, the largest demand in Africa. Um, we are the only ones reaching more than 36 gigawatts, so we are the epicenter of the demand of Africa. And then we've got smaller sections throughout Africa. Mostly used a traditionally vertically integrated system. This now has changed to a more horizontally integrated system where we work towards incorporating new technology and energy efficiency towards net zero. Right. So in Africa, we know that this is a continent poised to play a potential role in the um, a pivotal role in the strategies for ecological and social transition. So today, the global energy crisis all over is looking at the fact that we need to shift over to renewables and cleaner resources and incorporate the balance between the two. And we've all learned that renewables in itself is not all good and well, and there's a couple of complexities that comes with that. With the cost decreasing of renewables, however, um, there's a lot of renewable adoption, adoption happening both on large scale and smaller scale. And worldwide, we share a variable renewable expect, is expected to expand by 40, between 40 and 70 percent by 2050. And that is rapidly happening, as we've already seen with some of the stats shared today. Electricity demand is growing and, is, and is, it's an essential catalyst for economic growth and also therefore the part um, very important for economic and social development as well. The choices that we make today is going to shape the world for our children of tomorrow. Africa is not only a continent of immense beauty and diversity, but a region that holds immense potential for uh, positive change within the energy sector and potential um, production environment. Right. So what do we need in a cleaner energy production environment? What is the driving forces that we can see towards net zero? Sorry, towards net zero for a sustainable future to save the planet. So there's a number of aspects, number of aspects that we need to consider that drives these. First of all, from a utility point of view, we've got security from a national utility side that we need to make sure that there is enough supply and production to supply the demand needed um, for economic growth and sustainability of our people in our country. Then we've got the security from a consumer point of view. Each of the consumers and industry leaders need to make sure that they've got enough supply to um, supply their demand. Then we've got the responsibility of industry to use cleaner production that also plays a role towards net zero. And then, of course, governance and policy is what we need to go forward and make sure that there's enough incentive, incentives in place to make sure that we move towards a cleaner future. And then, of course, the social and economic stability plays a huge role, and a lot of these factors has got a lot of extra factors around it that plays a role and influences each of these towards net zero. If we then go into the fact that we need to always um, balance supply and demand. So incorporating renewables brought that on. The fact that we need to decarbonize and um, get rid of some of our carbon-laden um, supply sources and move over to cleaner production sources has created a new set of problems. 
And this has sometimes created security of supply and the mismatch between supply and demand. This is not something that's just in South Africa. The energy supply crisis is the single biggest risk globally, as actually mentioned by the World Economic Forum this year. And um, we know that each grid operator must make sure that they um, balance their supply and demand. So load curtailment is a global practice. They just do it in different ways and have different ways of looking at it. In South Africa, we're all teasing about this entire, this excessive load shedding that we've been having, but our socioeconomic status at this stage is in such, an, uh, is in such, such a place that it won't be able to um, absorb the fact of price increases or other levers that is used to manage supply and demand. So all over the world, there was different types of supply and um, or load curtailment that's been um, put in place. We can see South Africa has got the load shedding that we know about. UK has got incentives that they use for excessive, um, when they ex experience excessive um, equipment failures due to their, when they had their um, uh, heat, uh, what do you call it, um, heat waves that they had. And then in, in Europe, we all know because of the Ukrainian war, there was a shortage in gas. So they suddenly had to rely on the electricity, which then increased the, the demand. And then they had to revert to price signaling. And last year, they all had quite a lot of increases in their um, electricity prices, severe. But it also returned return to normal as soon as the demand was settled. India has been having load shedding for extensive hours a day. Um, North America, America and Middle East has also been having them. So we're not alone in this, but there's different forms of that. And it all is brought in by the mix of supply sources that's being used. To bring it a bit locally, I can use it as a case study. I used South Africa just to show you the effect. So what we've noticed from a utility point of view, the utility may have to make sure that they've got security of supply and they maintain their network and the network does not collapse due to over demand and a um, lesser supply. So this is showing you the excessive load shedding that we've been having. The blue graph actually shows the amount of um, days of load shedding that we've been having. 2023, we've got so far up until now, it was 246 days of the year. <laughs> of load shedding that we had. So you can see it is quite excessive. And if I say this, it's not one or two hours, it's anything between two and six hours. So it is rotational and it is quite bad. So you can imagine what the impact on our revenue and sales on that is from an energy point of view. All right, and in the bottom graph, you can see the total percentage of the peak system that it actually, amount of um, gigawatt, gigawatt hours and percentage that it actually influenced that we did not, that related to missing revenue. That um, in, com in comparison with that, then what that did is it actually sent out market signals and it changed the consumer behavior, which brought a whole new socioeconomic um, mismatch or um, problem on its own that we need to consider. So what we've realized is that there was an increase in the supply shortage, increase in load reduction, increase in tariffs and inflation, and an increase in negative sentiments towards the main utility and an increase in economic hardship. And together with that, we saw that there was new technology improvement and a decrease in the renewable and SSEG costs. So that, that related to a decrease in the energy market share from the utility side. So what that related to was to an increase in the, act, in the, excess, the access towards uh, renewable energy to each and every consumer in the form of solar PV um, and inverters and batteries. And then the, it basically opened up a whole new solar market for us. So we saw an exponential growth of rooftop PV um, from prior to 2022. In 2023 alone, we had about an additional three gigawatts of rooftop PV added onto, which was barely at 1,000 before 2022. So we had excessive growth in the PV adoption. So once again, this is changing the consumer behavior. So there's different areas, including this clean air production is now influencing the way utility has to work out their things. It also influences the way the consumer behaves and it influences the market out there. Right, so if we think about this question, action or reaction to, the, to save the planet. So if we take the first part and now my <laughs> the reaction was supposed to have a, a bullet. Um, if we start with reaction, there's first of all, we had no, we, we started to have no new coal fired stations. This related to security of supply constraints. This now relates to pricing influences, 
and intermittent supply and and grid expansion that need extra grid expansion that we needed right that in turn related to new energy and new markets that involved which then related to new technology involved involves in um, enhancement and a new um basically a whole new market and entrepreneurial market that opened up which led to some new industry evolve ev um, evolutions this led to new job creation which then contributes to the social part of what we're looking at in today's topic and then of course it relates to the economic development and then of oh, course i'm sorry guys my animation is is not far so the technology advancement and all of these interaction needs policy development and if we have that part we need to then look at sorry i'm just going to let it all go because it's wrong i think it's the wrong vision that i gave you the policy development then leads to action because it's one thing to react on what the environment is bringing us but it's another thing to take action and then the next step is to actually take action in developing strategies for social transition looking at the resource equities looking at repurposing of power stations which then leads to new job creations as well and looking at grid strengthening to accommodate additional renewables. So we need to take action to make sure that there's not such a significant impact of including renewables and climate reduction. So it's one thing to have a reaction, but we need to take action and ensure that policy and governance is backing us up and enabling us to actually take this action and implement it. As we said this morning, implementation is the biggest issue of everything. Right, so what is Africa's role and potential that we have? We've got a major sense of renewable energy potential. We've got abundant natural resources. We saw that in this morning's presentation as well. Solar, wind, hydro, geothermal, as well as hydrogen possibilities. We've got energy access, which is significant. There's still a significant energy poverty throughout the entire African area, even in South Africa, although there was already significant progress made and especially with microgrids and having localized generation availability um, and that all assists in having energy access. But that actually leads to um, sustainable development goals, which we really need to put in place. So Africa's got a commitment towards the United Nations goals um, and they've got an actual fr a framework that they um, presented. Um, to integrate ecological and societal um, transitions, because there's a lot of opportunity for transition in, in Africa. We're coming from a base where there's a lot of potential to still grow and put in new things. We can often leapfrog technology, which brings in green technology areas, where we can actually leapfrog from, we can learn from other areas and skip the coal-laden implementation and go straight to green. So we can now go to microgrids or isolated areas where we can provide electricity to people which is in far off regions or in smaller um, rural areas and we can actually um, supply them with cleaner sources instead of and skipping the, the carbon laden area. That also leads to job creation, because the more we internalize our generation of microgrids, our PV panels, um, all of those type of manufacturing, we can actually do it in-house. And, and that can lead to job creation, which can then um, help us migrate towards a low carbon economy in the end and create new jobs, developing renewable engine, additional renewable energy projects. Um, and this can all contribute to localization and poverty reduction. Um, in Africa. So that is all the potential that Africa has, some of it that I've just listed. So what are some of the actions we can take to save the planet? We can do additional renewable energy investment, so prioritize the investment in the, the renewable energy, um, incentivize the use of renewable sources. We've already done that to a point. Um, government has maybe <laughs> tricked us a little bit because they've incentivized that you don't have to register um, anything below 100 megawatts, which makes data analysis an absolute nightmare. Um, and people is not um, reacting the way that they should by just letting notifying the municipality on what they're using. So there is some of the municipalities starting to rectify that and try try to convince people to understand why they should um, 
uh, collaborate and actually just let us know about it because a lot of them has been negative towards the utility and they are more of a stance that you don't know you don't have to know what i'm doing because they're also scared that they're going to be taxed taxed extra and all of those type of things so we need more collaboration and communication to our actual customers so that they can understand what the broader picture is and why it's important to have that um, information exchange energy efficiencies we can still um, improve on building um, insulation, we don't have similar building insulation that um, Europe and some of the other countries have. Um, so we are very, very heavy on aircon and and heating in the winter and and cooling in the summer. Um, so that is still excessive. We can still work on that, although we've already had a lot of major um, gains on efficiencies as well. Then sustainable agriculture is also one of the areas. There's actually a lot of opportunity for employing green resources within um, the agricultural environment as they also operate on um, farm areas and they've got these full points they can work from from pvs and so forth um, so there are some market opportunities to promote ecological and social well-being on an agricultural well as well and then um, educational awareness also what i mentioned earlier we need to educate people to understand the bigger picture and to understand why we need to go agree green and also understand the, the impact of net zero that it's not all green and they all have to be a balance between the two um, but if we can understand it better and it would be better to have um, data visibility um, so that we can in in total incorporate all the information sets that we have so in conclusion change is in our hands to foster a future for our children and their children all actions require collaboration amongst governments, communities, businesses, academia, and individuals. Greater transparency is needed to assist in enhanced analysis and collaboration. And in conclusion, the, the, the choice between action and reaction is not merely, merely a theoretical debate. It is a call for action for groups like us today gathered here. Africa has the potential to demonstrate that ecological and social transitions um, is not only necessary, but also feasible. And um, so let us up embrace this opportunity, working together to create a future where the actions we take today will be celebrated by generations to come. The time for, for rhetoric is over, the time for action is now. Thank you.